Hola, muy buenas tardes. Les damos una cordial bienvenida en nombre del Comité Organizador de la CHEC 2020. Mi nombre es Jorge Andrés Vélez Muñoz y soy el director de internacionalización de CEIPA Business School en Medellín, miembro del Comité Nacional de la RCI en representación del Nodo Occidente. Es un gran honor y un gran placer acompañarlos en esta sesión de la nutrida y enriquecedora agenda que nos ha propuesto el equipo organizador de la CHEC Online. We will do this in Spanish and English at least this part of the presentation. Afterwards, everything will be in English. So I warmly uh, welcome you on behalf of La Czech 2020 Organizing Committee. My name is Jorge Andres Vélez Muñoz, and I am the Director of International Affairs at CEPA Business School in Medellín, and a member of the RCI National Committee representing the West Node. It is a great honor and a great pleasure to be with you in this cultural session of the valuable and enriching agenda that the LACHEC Online Organizing Team has proposed. Les recordamos a los participantes e invitados que se encuentran en la sala mantener sus micrófonos apagados durante la sesión. Cualquier inquietud o pregunta que tengan sobre la temática que les vamos a presentar, les pedimos el favor de que la registren en nuestro chat o sigan las indicaciones del moderador. Ustedes, en su pantalla, pueden escoger la vista que deseen, vista para ver al hablante o para ver la galería de las personas presentes. We remind all participants and guests in the virtual room to keep their microphones muted during the session. Any comment or question you have about the subject that we are going to present, we ask you to please register it in our chat or follow the instructions of the moderator. You, on your screen, can choose the view style you want. You can see the speaker or the gallery of the people involved in the session. Esta sesión es en realidad un taller con el artista maori Warren Warbrick sobre música maori. Tocará los instrumentos tradicionales que fabrica y hablaremos de su oficio y de la transmisión de conocimientos culturales. Warren Warbrick es considerado uno de los artistas más importantes de Nueva Zelanda. Es un músico que no solo fabrica instrumentos musicales tradicionales maoríes, sino que también investiga sobre ellos. Discute la importancia cultural de esta música y también la relación multicultural entre Nueva Zelanda y América Latina, particularmente Brasil. This session is actually a workshop with Maori artist Warren Warbrick on Maori music. He will be playing the traditional instruments he makes and he will uh, be talking about his craft and about the transmission of cultural knowledge. Considered one of the New Zealand's leading artists, Warren Warbrick is a musician who not only makes traditional Maori musical instruments, but conducts research on them. He discusses the cultural importance of this music and as well as the multicultural relationship between New Zealand and Latin America, particularly Brazil. In order to start this session, I would like to introduce my dear colleague, Javiera Vicedo from Chile. She will be our moderator and co-host to make this uh, interesting workshop even more multicultural, enriching and valuable. So Javiera, uh, please uh, turn on your camera and go ahead. Um, well, um, good afternoon, buenas tardes, um, kia ora, uh, welcome everyone. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Jorge, for um, your presentation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be having this afternoon two great um, colleagues uh, and, uh, and representatives from, uh, from New Zealand joining, joining us today. As Jorge mentioned, we do have present here um, prestigious musician uh, Warren. Uh, he's also uh, is with uh, Professor uh, Leonel Alvarado. Uh, Professor Leonel uh, Alvarado, he's a um, poet uh, and essayist. Uh, he's from Massey uh, University. He's the director of the Spanish and Portuguese programs at Massey University. He also has received several international awards. His most uh, recent book is Central American Patriotic uh, Lyricism, Hymns, Nationalism, and Identity. Uh, Leonel this morning is joining, uh, well, this morning, New Zealand, our afternoon. Uh, Leonel is joining us from Wellington, and it's a pleasure also to welcome Warren uh, from Palmerston North as well. So thank you very much, uh, Leonel and Warren, for joining us uh, today. Uh, it's great to be uh, sharing this session with you at last day of La Czech. 
been a pleasure for Education New Zealand participating in this free uh, three days event as um, silver sponsor. Uh, Colombia and Latin America is a really important partner for New Zealand uh, and especially for the New Zealand government as well. So that is a pleasure also to end this wonderful three days of LATEC with this wonderful um, workshop. So Leonel and Worry, I, I give you <laughs> the floor is, is yours and looking forward to listen on what you're going to share with us today. Eh, buenas tardes, eh, muchas gracias Javiera, gracias Jorge, gracias a la CHEC, que sé que ha sido un éxito eh, total, gracias por la invitación. So it's, it's wonderful to, to be here always uh, to keep this, this connection uh, going with you guys and um, congratulations on the success of, of la CHEC. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a big privilege for me to, to, be, to be here and an enormous pleasure to, to be with Warren Warwick, uh, as uh, Jorge was saying, he's a, a leading artist uh, in, in New Zealand. Uh, he's a great researcher of tra traditional uh, Maori music and uh, he makes these this wonderful instruments. Uh, we've been collaborating for a number of years now. We have wonderful projects together and wonderful conversations about, um, about Maori music. And, about this connection between um, Latin America in music too. Uh, we work in the past with uh, um, researchers from, from Brazil and also musicians from, from Panama. Um, so we keep this, this connection going. So we thought that uh, we'll, we'll get together with you guys, guys and, um, and share this, um, this, uh, uh, um, this, this conversation. So to include you, you also, in, in the conversation in, in about the work that Warren has been doing. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, two or three years ago, Warren had the, uh, um, I know it was a pleasure for him too, and uh, uh, to, to go to the poetry festival in, in Medellin, which as we know is, is a prestigious poetry festival, which I believe is, is going on at the, at the moment too, um, online. And I know that uh, Warren got to meet with um, different indigenous artists from, from all over the world. Um, so perhaps it would be good for us to start the conversation um, for you, Warren, to, to, to tell us about that experience over in Medellin. And so again, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing um, your, your knowledge and then your work, your craft with all of us. And again, welcome. And so we, we can start talking about this, Warren. Thank you for being here. Um, yes, thank, thank you very much for having me take part in, in, in this event. It's, um, and also, it's always a pleasure to be, to be working with you, Leonel. And, um, and in terms of um, the experience in, in Medellin, it, uh, I must say the place is a beautiful place. The, um, <laughs> the, the weather is incredible. Um, it was insanely hot. When, when we were there, but um, I think one of the things I found is is um, that what we experienced there were, were, was that the, the people were insanely friendly and they were always helpful and, and they looked after us incredibly well. Um, on our first um, Bit of a funny story, really. Um, on our first day there, we in the um, in the evening it was very very hot. We we gathered at a, a stage in, in uh, an open park area where a lot of the event was to be um, uh, presented um, in terms of the public. And what what I noticed is everyone was placing their um, or were, were wearing their national costume. Um, so it was a bit um, hard in, a, in another country to say to um, one of the local people, my national costume is quite little, um, um, am I going to be in trouble wearing this? And he goes, oh, what do you mean by little? And I said, well, um, it's only a little... Uh, triangle of um, cloth in the front and, and a small cloak. And uh, they were very supportive of me wearing that. Um, 
But through doing that, wearing tr traditional costume there was really interesting too, because it really sparked off a whole lot of conversation with the younger Colombians who, who were um, well versed in some of our um, old culture through um, movie, um, especially the River Queen and Once Were Warriors and and because of those, a lot of young people wanted to have photographs with me and and um, so it was quite interesting hearing those um, uh, pieces of information but but the the other thing I enjoyed there was that the collaboration in terms of um, the uh, indigenous peoples there, especially shaman, um, although there were a lot of um, people from around the world who are from that shaman side of things, or for, for a better word, we, we don't really use the, the word shaman here, we use the word tohunga, um, but, but to be able to be uh, um, allowed to be involved in, in the ceremonies in measured in with, with, in terms of how we um, presented our stage. It was quite amazing because we were burning um, particular plants that were uh, a form of medicine, if you like, and, and doing a collaborative ceremony to start our whole uh, proceedings was, was unreal. Um, and to find that um, in Medellin, as part of the um, ceremony, they play a, 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 um, a show trumpet, um, to which later on I uh, got the opportunity to play our show trumpets, our putatara, um, alongside um, uh, the shaman of Medellin, and, and that was a real special moment as well. And um, yeah, it was really, um, uh, how would you say, and culturally inspiring really, to, to well, actually see that many of our stories are very similar, many of our um, um, historical ways of doing things are very similar and um, yeah, I, I quite enjoyed that. So, so you mentioned, Warren, that you participated in a few ceremonies. So, so I know there is a ceremonial aspect to Maori music that, as, mm -hmm. as, 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 as you said in, in the past, the Maori music is not for entertainment, but, but there, is a ceremony, there are rituals that come with Maori music. Um, could you please talk about that? It would be good to share yeah, that idea of that ceremonial aspect of music. Oh, yes. Well, we have um, the... The ceremonies are, are very vast, and and also they they change between um, different hapu and iwi across the country. Um, so in in terms of our instruments, um, there are very uh, many many stories, and they some of them all have a common thread between them, such as um, where. In Medellin, I found um, that in the ceremonies that I took part in, one of the main instruments was a was a shell trumpet, and they'll have several people playing them. For us, it's, it's very similar, and um, our shell shells are very very hard to get hold of. They wash up on onto the shores um, very infrequent. So once we have one, we we embed it with a lot of personality, if you like, in terms of we would name the instrument, we would um, play it only at particular ceremonies or or to acknowledge um, um, uh, our karanga, if you like, or, or when we are bringing people onto our, our marae. But in terms of the shell, such as this one here, <coughs> sorry. This is known as a putatara. So this is a native shell from from uh, Aotearoa or New Zealand. You can see it has a, a wooden mouthpiece on. I noticed in Medellin the, the mouthpiece is not there. It is just sort of cut off and the interior broken out a little bit. 
our Samoan relations in the islands will do that as well. Um, so this, the shell, even though it's just a simple trumpet uh, made from a shell, if you think of it in, in terms of our, our history, say, um, in, our, in our beginnings of time, or our, and within our creation myth, this is only one story, but within our creation myth, we have the sky, and then we have um, the earth. In our belief system, it is believed that the sky is the male element, this, the earth is the female element, and in the beginnings of time, they were, they were joined together. They had a number of children in between here. Um, in, in some tribal areas, they state that there were 70 children um, trapped between their parents. The oldest of those decided that they would separate the parents to bring growth and spiritual light into, into the world. Um, as we know, when we, we are um, in relationships, we like to be together. So obviously, Papa Tuanuku and Rangi Nui um, kept pulling each other back together to embrace. Now, the, the oldest children spent much time trying to separate the parents, and by the time they separated them and were successful to allow them to have growth, and this, this ancestor who did this, his name was... Um, was uh, Tane Mahuta. He had a brother called Tangoroa. He was of the ocean. So when the se parents were separated, Tangoroa of the ocean sung the world into existence. And he used a putatara. So we do the same thing when we speak of children being born on, um, we will play an instrument to um, bring that child into the world or to announce to the living as well as our people who have gone before that this child is here. Um, we use it on the marae to enhance the words of, of uh, um, karakia um, and also to enhance the, the, um, um, the karanga that the women do to, to bring people onto our marae. And it kind of sounds a bit like this. Um, so the, the sound you heard there, we usually play three times. Um, there is a hidden, well, in terms of that sound, we, we refer to that as being a voice or, or a kōrero. So, um, so in Medellin, I noticed that the shaman would play four times facing four different ways in terms of the, the four elements. And um, in some ways we do the same thing, but we only make three sounds or, or voices. The fourth one is actually the breath or the ho going through the instrument. So we kind of do things slightly differently, but very much the same, yeah. So each instrument in Maori music has a, has a history, has a pakapapa. Yes, yes. It's, one of the things that is the, uh, the strongest element of, of being Māori and is whakapapa. And whakapapa isn't just about our, our, um, our personal genealogy or, or uh, relationship, but also it's our relationship to our environment and, and going back further. So when, when I refer to uh, papatu and nuku and haranginui, being sky and, and land, um, we can through our whakapapa, we can take direct relationship to that. And so, so those elements are, are 
to us are, are known as the primal parents, or the, not just of the way of our earthers, but for us as well, as a people. So how did music come into your life, uh, Warren? Is music part of, uh, part of your Paka Papa too? Yes. Um, at the time, in terms of these instruments, at the time I, um, I was working in the museum uh, in Palmerston North here, the Manawatu Museum, and I was doing a bit of research um, into um, my own family line. Although I'm a Warbrick here, uh, the Warbricks um, are related more closely to Te Arawa, but Warbricks came down into Manawatu and married into Rangitani. So our Rangitani whānau name here, or family name, is Te Aweawe. I have a great uncle um, by the name of Wurumu Kingi Te Aweawe. And um, at the museum, he, he was who I was researching at the time. And at the museum, I found that um, he died in 1971. In his lifetime, he was a musician. And um, he was a jazz musician. He played jazz piano. He also played um, organ for, for church services and, and many other things. Um, but what I found out through my research is that when he was a young boy, he was brought up by his grandparents. His grandparents influenced his music by playing to him as a child an instrument known as a koowa, which is which is a very simple instrument. It's, it's a, um, can be made from bone and, and wood and it's, it's got a, a hole all the way through and can be played with holes or, or, or without. And um, that got me interested because I actually, back at that time, this was in the 19, early, uh, mid 80s, a lot of our musical instruments had been um, lost to us, basically. They were found in museums and we knew they existed, but there were very few people that knew how to play them. So when finding one of my ancestors was a player and of these instruments got me very, very interested in what these were. So from there, I, I um, started looking at, well, <clears throat> I suppose it was easy for me because I was working in a museum, but being able to work through the museum profession to, to look at instruments and, and collections. Also, at the time, I didn't realise that a man by the name of Richard Nunns in Hirini, Melbourne, were um, on their own journey in terms of reviving our instruments, and also Brian Flintoff making instruments, and um, this whole new experimental concept going on. So, um, I was kind of <coughs> working in my own little bubble, if you like, um, trying to work out, one, how to make it, two, why it exists, and three, how do you play it? And um, I had a, a kind of a funny situation happen, really. Um, so going back to, to the mid-80s, I spent hours and hours trying to make a sound from these, and I finally did make a sound from it. The other interesting thing is, is that Richard Nunns in Hidden New Melbourne came to Palmerston North and performed at the Art Gallery. And a friend of mine that I work with, a colleague, went to that concert and I thought, well, he could have told me about that <laughs> and I would have liked to have gone too. But when he came back the next day and told me about it, I said to him, so what, what did the Kōwōwō sound like? And he said, oh, it sounded very much like a violin. And I thought, Flute and violin. Hmm. So I spent a lot of time trying to make my instrument sound like a violin. <laughs> Jumping into the future um, to to now, a few years back, um, a young um, composer by the name of Selena Fisher composed a string quartet piece of music with the New Zealand string quartet 
based on an instrument I made a friend of mine, Rob Thorne, who, who put a YouTube clip on uh, of him playing a, a putorino, um, which is um, uh, one of these. And she composed a piece of music to that, which kind of became full circle. I was back in the early days told this sounds like a violin, couldn't make it sound like a violin, but she was able to make violins and cellos sound like the instrument I made my friend. And um, no, that really um, kind of excited me in some ways in terms of um, being very modern about our traditional forms. But the, the kōwōwō also, even though it is so simple, you can do a lot um, in terms of sound with it. And um, they have also a huge amount of stories around them in terms of their history and their connections to people. And And what I'll do is I'll tell you one story. It might be a bit long, but um, in terms of um, the kōwōwō, let, let's talk about, um, say, the bone kōwōwō, because the bone kōwōwō is quite interesting. Traditionally, we made our bone kōwōwō uh, from human thigh bone. There's a reason for using that, and, this, and we're not unique in this. Um, cultures all over the world used human remains for instruments and, and all sorts of um, religious purposes. But for us, um, it was very, very special to us to use the thigh bone. We have an old story um, back amongst my Tiarawa people of a um, um, of, a, of a love interest between Tutanakai and Hinemoa, where Tutanakai used his uh, bone flute um, to woo his partner. Um, but I won't go into that story too much. Um, and that, that's in very simple terms. But the story I would like to talk about is this. Back before European times, we had forms of what we call tangihanga. Tangihanga are um, our um, traditional burial rites or, or, or traditions. We would bury people, um, not necessarily in, in the ground, we would place them in carved boxes that would go into caves and we would also use hollowed trees. Um, usually this was done for uh, high-ranking people or chiefly people. It wasn't for everyone. And um, so if we could imagine that there is a, um, um, a chief that has been doing everything that is right for his people. And this chief, um, he was able to keep his people safe. He was able to keep them fed. He kept all of the tribal alliances working incredibly well. He did everything right. But the sad thing is, is that today he passes away. So what would happen when he dies is that, I'm going to do this in brief because it's a very long story, but what would happen um, is that the immediate family would, or whānau, would tend to his body and they would pre prepare him for, for the, um, what would be coming next. So they would dress him in, his, in all his finery. He would have all his statements of mana with him, his weapons, his, his um, uh, mere pōngamu, everything that is, symbolises his strength and mana. Other members of the family would be outside the village in a designated space where they would build a platform that would be between a, a metre to three metres high. And on that platform, they would ceremonially place 
Lucifer's body. <coughs> Underneath there would, um, um, not far from it, would be what is known as a, a faripuni, which is a, like a sleep house to which the family would live in. And they would be guarding over his body over a period of time. We must remember too that these tangi of, of early days in terms of our um, chiefly men and, and women were over a period of six months to a year, depending on how the body decays. While, while the body is on the platform and it is um, deteriorating, if you like, um, there would be a, a carved box ca um, created, which is known as a wakatupapaku, which the bones, once they've been, um, the flesh has been taken away by the environment, that the bones would be going into that box. Once the bones are free of, of, um, of, of the bodily flesh, the bones would be all collected up and then taken to a cave. And this cave would be a secret place. So the family will be sitting inside the cave and they'll take the bones and they would cleanse them. And as they're touching them and having a physical attachment to the person who has passed, they'll be also talking about who he was, what he did for his people. And while they're doing these discussions and, and talk about him, they'll be creating what we call ori ori and motietia or, or um, chants that would talk of these histories. And then the thigh bone would be selected, it would be taken away and it would be carved into a flute to symbolize that person. So that when it's taken back to the cave, they would use it to enhance the oriori and motia tia that they have composed. And then later, once all of the bones and everything have gone into the waka tupapaku and the people have gone back to the village, the flute would go back with them and then it would become him physically and also spiritually, but also we can listen to him speak again. So, um, <coughs> this one is not human bone. Um, this one is um, uh, cassowary or is, is an offshoot of the ostrich and it's as close as we can get to the same size hole as what is in the human thigh bone. It has that type of of tone, and some of them are depending on the size of the the um, interior. The larger the interior, the kind of the deeper the type of tone. A very narrower form inside will give you a higher pitch. Hmm. This is known as kowai. Kowai, yeah. Hmm. Uh, so, so you work with uh, with bone, with uh, wood, and also with with stone, right? Are those the, the main uh, materials that you work with? Yes, I use stone as well. Um, there's a really interesting instrument that relates to our, um, how would you say, our, our religious men in terms of um, uh, our tohunga. Our tohunga noticed a number of things before European times. In days of old, we would make tools from a particular type of stone, and it is known as pākohi to us, but um, uh, the technical term for it, I guess, is uh, metamorphosized mudstone. So it's very fine sediment that has been pressured by the earth and it becomes insanely hard. We use it to make tools. So when, you, when we're making tools, so if you're making a stone tool, you have a, a, a stone, that is the, um, the one that will become the, the tool. And a secondary stone, which is 
made from um, what was called Groshali garnet, which was a very, very hard stone. It comes from the south. To make the tool, you have to break pieces off. So you're making the sound all the time. And you're flaking large pieces of stone off. Then to flatten the area, you do what we call a, a crushing technique or bruising technique, which is doing this. This is a very long and laborious job to knock down all the high points off a stone to make it smooth before grinding. So what our religious men found is that through listening to these, these sounds of tapping or repetitive sounds, it puts the mind into a, a very meditative state. So they used to use it a lot in what we call the, the whariwānanga, where um, the whariwānanga is a place of learning or like a, a school of learning, if you like, where information is chanted to, to those who are receiving learning and the stones are used to keep them on track or on rhythm. It is also used in the idea of karakia or, or the use of prayer where the um, instrument is used to, one, open a space or open a, um, a spiritual doorway so that the karakia can be directly um, heard by those to whom you have chosen to speak to um, in another realm, if you like, or another spiritual realm. So the sound of these um, uh, sound a bit like this. This this is a simple one. I'll just put this this way. And then we have this one here. This one is done with pākohi. Pākohi is a metamorphosized mudstone. This one is very, very hard, as you can hear. And this here is a, a, a small adz form that is from a, a very old um, site where, where we used to make tools before European times. So this stone here, it's so hard that it has a really ringing sound to it. So um, let's listen to this variant of the um, uh, what we call the uh, pakuru, or not pakuru. Um, tumu tumu, sorry. This instrument is called a tumu tumu. It's uh, tumu tumu. And you mentioned Warren uh, before, and you showed before the uh, the puto dino. And uh, I know there is a, there's an interesting story behind that that instrument. Oh yes, puto dino. Um, yes, I've got a. Um, the puto dino uh, is a. It's an interesting instrument. Actually, it was kind of funny in Medellin when I was there for the festival because in the university when I was there, I um, uh, I had an interpreter with me as I was talking to um, a number of people at the university about 
uh, our instruments. And when it came to this instrument, um, apparently the, the word, I'm not sure which part of the word putorino um, it was, but apparently over there it's slang for something not quite nice. <laughs> so I mean, every time I mention the name of the instrument, um, yeah, I got some funny looks. <laughs> Uh, especially from the interpreter who um, started to ask me a few questions about how how we could use that word in a different way so it didn't mean something else. But um, the, the instrument is quite interesting because it's very unique. It's In terms of all of our instruments that we have as Māori, um, many of them are found in cultures all over the world um, in one way or another. You know, as in terms of our, our trumpet, we, you know, um, we play those in the Pacific Islands, we play them in Melanesia and throughout Asia, and also in, in, in Medellin and um, in Colombia. This instrument, um, from what we know, is, is only found here in Aotearoa, or New Zealand, and this is why. So, um, can we see that? Oh, yeah. This thing here looks kind of strange. This is actually a case moth. It's a, um, the female moth makes this cocoon. And, um, and from what we know about the way the, the, um, the moth works is that she'll make this cocoon. She doesn't actually become a, a moth. Um, we have a number of stories about about this particular uh, moth and um, apparently according to uh, science if you like the male um, mates with the female through the base of the of the cocoon through the stories that we have from our um, our old people that occurs through the top here through a hole and I think um, historical, we've got to remember historical stories are done for a certain purpose and a certain way of putting across information. So that, that, that is what the case moth looks like. As you can see, it's kind of kind of cigar kind of shape. And um, the putorino also has that, that shape. So the whole embodiment of the instrument um, mimics the shape of the cocoon and strongly resembles the female element. So this is, well, embodies the female. For us, the, the case moth is known as Henero Kitauri and she is also the embodiment of, or the personification of Māori music. So she's embodied in all of our, or well, the majority of our instruments. So within our traditional stories, which is quite different to the scientific story, um, or the, the female will make a hole at the top here in her cocoon at a certain time of the year. She, she does this so that when the wind blows across that hole, it creates a sound which alerts the males. The males will come, once they hear it, and they will come to, through the hole in, inside, they would mate, and then she would, <clears throat> if you like, um, gather as many males inside the cocoon as she can. Once it's filled to a certain point, she will lay her eggs on top of these males, so that when, when the eggs hatch, the young will have something nourishing to feed on. Um, it's not that within culture we're, we're, we are encouraging our young to eat their fathers, but um, the idea is that the, um, the males, just as much as the females, have a responsibility to the um, upbringing of those children. Hopefully that makes sense. <coughs> so this instrument is used for the celebration of life, the celebration of death, um, the coming together of male and female. Um, it's 
all about um, the birthing process. A lot of our instruments, in fact, are actually more to do with female than they are male. So within tradition, most of these, or almost all of them, were all played by women for women. And, um, and over the, our early days of um, uh, reviving these instruments, we found it quite hard trying to get women involved. Nowadays, we have a huge amount of women involved in the, and it's just awesome. Um, so um, in terms of this instrument, I'll, I'll show you why it is unique. Um, we have, we can play it as a flute. At the top end, in the central point, we can play it as another form of flute. Also, we can play it as a trumpet. So this is what we call the uh, concordion. So you were saying, Warren, that um, there is a, a close relationship between uh, some instruments in, in Maori music and medicine. Some instruments are used with medicinal purposes. Is that right? Yes, yes. I, I noticed when when we um, um, went up into the hills, um, <clears throat> a lot of us were the um, uh, indigenous knowledge holders and, and shaman. And we went in and took part in some of the ceremonies in the, um, in the mother hut. And, uh, and what I noticed in, in there is that there was um, some string instruments, but um, we as a people, we don't really have string instruments as Māori. We, we, we only have one really, which is known as a, as a ku. And it's, played with the mouth and um, but one of the instruments that I found really interesting but didn't really get a chance to um, engage with in a, in a more meaningful way was that um, there were these long um, bamboo flutes and um, and from what I could tell they, they were also side blowing like, like ours are and had uh, holes down near the bottom of the instrument rather than at the top. And yeah, it was really, <clears throat> really cool to be involved in, in ceremony and seeing those instruments being used. It's, um, you know, for, for people here in Aotearoa, um, especially for our um, um, people who are non-Māori, it is very difficult for people who are non-Māori to to see our ceremonies happen or even experience a time on, on a marae. And I'm guessing that is very similar in, in Medellin to experience what happens in the mother hut. So I, I felt very privileged to be there. And, um, and in fact, uh, Leonel, you you have been on our marae out at Rangi or two, and um, you know, I, I hope you had a similar experience there. <laughs> Um, um, it's um, yeah, it's a very special moment to see the, these things happening, and uh, I kind of wish that some of the Native American um, knowledge holders kind of wish that they had brought some of their instruments. Um, but I, I know um, that the um, the gentleman from uh, Tuva brought his instrument 
and they had you know, it was quite amazing really like we 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 were in in the place where we were staying for for the event um we were like 12 stories up in, up in the air in the in the older part of of Medellin and the room next door to us was the chap um, the gentleman from um Tuva and every morning he would go out on the on his balcony and practice his string instrument and do the most amazing um, throat singing from from his cultural background. It was it was the best thing to wake up to in the morning and to uh, to listen to. It was uh, amazing, and and to and to be like it. Uh, our last event in Medellin was a a concert that we did, or kind of a concert program. You know, there was, you know, in terms of poetry, uh, um, it's probably the biggest audience I've ever seen at a, at a poetry festival. And it's really amazing to see the audience react in the way that they do. It was like being at a rock concert. It, it was awesome. And, and also to hear, um, uh, also, to have um, the gentleman from Tuva um, play while we were doing ceremonies as well was um, was magic, and uh, yeah, I, I wish I had more time to had of um, seen more of the instruments that were were played in the mother hut at a, at a more deeper level. But there was so much going on and so much to be involved in, and yeah, it was magic. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. My goodness. Uh, yes, and I did have the pleasure of going to to MRI, which is this communal house where everyone is is welcome, but you have to be invited to be there. So it's a privilege mm -hmm. uh, to be there. And I can see that that some music can be performed there, but also outside. And, and one of the things that you do, Warren, is uh, and I think it's, it's extraordinary what you do is that you go out and teach about um, about Maori music. You go into the community, go and talk to to kids, to school kids, and uh, the spreading of knowledge, I think, is very, very important in, in, in Maori culture, and, and, and you use music uh, and your art uh, um, to do that. Yes. Um, I should have said in the beginning that I, I'm a member of a group called Haumanu, and it was a group that was set up by Richard Nunns in, in Hidden in Melbourne. Um, and also Brian Flintoff. And since their time in the, in the 80s of doing research and reviving instruments, there's been a, a number of us that are now continuing this. So we are now working through a, a new new avenues and also bringing on new people um, to, to continue this. And we're working with Creative New Zealand at the moment to create a, a strategy to, to um, um, make the journey a lot stronger and, and also our revival stronger. But yeah, so we use our, uh, my instruments in, in a number of um, uh, contemporary ways. Um, also, I must say too that a lot of our uh, players and um, uh, researchers in, in Haumanu have worked with people all over the world and orchestras and with um, um, R&B and, and rap and jazz and we've tried to implement our instruments into as many musical forms as possible to to um, to get more people interested in it and to also understand where we are as a people and um, but in terms of art forms, myself and my wife Virginia, we um, we do a very strong bicultural concept um, in terms of uh, music collaboration. Virginia um, has a, a, a strong um, tradition of music from um, from choral singing, so she's got a very uh, strong soprano voice. And, and it's quite interesting where we would use her voice and my instrument 
to collide, if you like. And, uh, and we did a, um, we had a, an artist here in, in Palmerston North who's, who's now passed away, but his name was John Bevan Ford. And I worked with John for over 20 years until he passed away. And they did a retrospective of his work at the art gallery here in Palmerston North. In the gallery, the, the space has a very echoey sound, so it can hold a, a tone for um, 30 or 40 seconds, and, and it vibrates. And um, so what, what we did was um, created a piece of music that was an art, art piece more than uh, informative music, if you like, because John was very strong on, on music as well. So we put the audience in the middle of a large gallery so that when we performed, we were on different sides of that gallery and moving around at the same time. And as using the instrument and Virginia's voice, it would collide in the center and would vibrate. And Virginia could alter the tone of her sound and her voice to make the music move up and down. And so that the audience could feel it at their sitting level, but also above their head. So we experimented with lots of areas of trying to make sound vibrate. But also we like to use uh, a lot of historical narratives relating to Palmerston North in terms of the relationships between Māori and Pākehā here at, at um, early contact in terms of uh, the uh, beginnings of our township. And so we've done a number of performances based around that. And also we, we also took that to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. It was um, referred to as Kono. That was the name of that one. We did another one which was more fictitious, but um, talked a, a, a lot about the historic nature of Palmerston North, but we had this element that was um, a made up story, if you like. It wasn't based on history, but based on ideas of history. So um, we had a, a rather large screen that would have images projected onto it. and um, and Virginia would be sitting behind the screen and I would be out the front of the screen. So the whole concept was based a uh, 400 years ago. So I'm dressed in 400 year old costume, which um, is very little. <laughs> um, it was great that we did this in summer. Um, and what the whole idea is, is that this tohunga or religious man 400 years ago was using a, a, a tumutumu or an instrument to to find a wahitapu or sacred sacred um, uh, place, you know. And uh, sorry, I just blow my nose. In this sacred place, happened to be a hole in the ground. When he found the hole, what what? what the tohunga found is that there's these sounds emanating from it and he, he couldn't understand what these sounds were. So by using Māori musical instruments um, and a series of these and playing to the whole, he felt he was able to possibly communicate through sound to, to what he was hearing, believing that these sounds were the sounds of Atua trying to speak to him or spiritual beings. But actually what it was, was a um, um, 400 year old Spanish religious sounds coming from the hole. So, the, so it was kind of a, um, yeah, a, a collaboration between these two places on the opposite side of the world. And, and Virginia is very good at research and, and, and numbers. So she was able to work out what town was actually on the other side of the world of Palmerston North. And um, I'm not very good at saying the whole name, but the name is um, uh, San Martin. Um, 
it has a very long into that and I can't really pronounce that but um, it's in Spain and um, yeah so it was quite exciting to find that and um, and also the, the, the town is very small there's only like 8,000 people I think live there and when we got more and more in depth into our, our performance and, and had performed it in a number of places um, we made the decision that we would go there and um, and we did and we performed this piece of music in um, in San, Ma uh, San Martin in, uh, in Spain and that was a really interesting journey as well. Yes, and so we have a question here from Gloria Zapata. She's asking, when you were in Medellin, did you get to meet any um, indigenous uh, uh, from, from Colombia and any instruments uh, or any artists uh, that you got to, to interact with when you were over there? Yes. Um, two, two of the people that I, I spent a lot of time with, one was um, uh, Nordic, not, not from from uh, the area, obviously. But the other was a, a chap by the name of Ikoro. And Ikoro um, had spent time in New Zealand. And um, he plays a whole range of, of different instruments. And um, so I, I spent a lot of time with him and we, we had a lot in common. And he was really helpful with, for me in terms of getting to navigate my way around and um, yeah it was he was he was awesome and I, I'm still in contact with um, uh, with Ikoro yeah uh, he, he actually the way we met was um, he came out of the, the uh, elevator and I was standing right in front of him and he just pointed at me and said I've got something for you and then he went back into the elevator and I thought well that's weird I've just met this person and he's got something for me but we have a, um, a famous poet um, here in New Zealand and um, I think that's his name James K Baxter his name is and he he lived in Whanganui for a very long time and what Ikoro had done is translated his poetry into Spanish um, and so he, he had copies of the book for me um, which which I found um, quite quite amazing um, yeah so we just from that uh, meeting we, we got to know each other quite well but also we we um, got to share instruments but not because of the whole process of our um, um, event was moving all the time. So um, we got to know each other quite well, but we didn't get to collaborate too much. We, it would have been nice to do more, um, but you know, like I might be sent off to a university in, um, in, the, in Medellin to do a speech, or talk, and then he gets sent way up in the hills by helicopter to another, uh, to a small village where he would do stuff. So we were always all, everyone were all over the place, and it was. But in saying that, it was really good too. It was awesome. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and that is the nature of the festival, no? to, to to going out into into the communities and you know sharing yeah. all this this wonderful knowledge and the wonderful art. Which is something that that you do here too. I mean, you collaborate with with artists, with writers, with with poets, and uh, one of these things that I had the um, the great pleasure of being involved in was uh, was a work that we did a few years ago with an artist from Panama, um, Romulo Castro, that we recorded uh, an iconic Latin American song that is uh, La Rosa de los Vientos, the Wind Rose, that was recorded by Ruben Blades and I mean, among others. So we created the Rosa Maori, and you brought some of the instruments, some Maori instruments into the um, into that song. Uh, into so it's a fusion of Maori and Latin American music that came together. Maybe there's a way for us to share the the link uh, uh, to people who who are here. Um, 
Oh yes, that there is. So 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 Javier has just shared the the link of this beautiful La Rosa Maori. Uh, so can 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 you talk about about that experience, Warren? Uh, how was it for you to 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 work with with a Latin American artist? Um, at first, I didn't know how that was going to happen um, because of of language barrier. But at the end of the day. Um, um, we were lucky to have you, you there, um, Leah, now, and um, and also um, it's kind of interesting you now um, when you have artists um, talking to each other. At times, it's like um, um, because it's to do with sound. It was more <coughs> the, the language barrier wasn't really a problem. It was because um, we really we spoke through sound and, and through music and and I was quite pleased that he was able to give me um, some recordings of of the piece of music and so what I would do is is listen to that and listen to what he had to say and and he listened to what I had to say and then we actually did a bit of a before we even did the recording, we did a, a, a small concert in Palmerston North, and um, and what what I did was um, took along a series of instruments that I felt would be able to help underneath his, his sound, and yeah, it was really quite interesting. We just basically improvised hard and. Um, and it worked, and it worked re quite well, I, I believe. And um, and in some cases, it would have been quite cool if we had a bit more time together. But uh, but I think the time we had, and and what we came up with in terms of the the music was was quite good. It was very good. And um, yeah. Oh, and and it was it was really. Um, uh, great to um, bring him a, as well as Leonel out to our marae and um, perform for him and um, and others out there. And also, um, in terms of our our um, marae process or, or what we call the, the porphyry, um, there is a part where we do our our fire or, or our our encounter where we uh, each, each side. Or speak to each other, um, and uh, Romolo. Um, so when one person gets up and, and does their their talk or their their kōrero, or um, uh, once he's finished, the others will get up and do a waiata or, or a song so that he can sit down. And um, and for the visitor side. Romolo played his guitar and and sung and um, yeah there was magic to have that, that to happen on our marae um, yeah no it was, it was it was really good memories of that time yeah wonderful wonderful now now people uh, will get to to listen to it, to it and also to see some of the instruments that you share with us today and some other instruments uh, um, and you'll see some some parts of of New Zealand it will be another way for us to carry on with this uh, wonderful uh, conversation. And so thank you so much, uh, uh, Warren, and thanks to, to everyone uh, who been here. Um, it's, it's, it's been always a pleasure. And one of the things that Warren was saying that he realized when, when he was in Medellin was that we share so many stories I mean, across the Pacific and uh, there are so many things that we have in common. Uh, even though we are, we're far apart, but we're also very, very close. We're part of the same, same community. And that it shows really well in, in, um, in this conversation that we had today. So thank you so much. Uh, um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a privilege. And, and I don't know if you have any, any, other, any other things that you would like to share with us, Warren, too. Yeah. Um, one thing. Um, I love my time over there in, in Medellin. I, I enjoyed every aspect of it. Every day was a uh, an enlightening experience, and um, 
and I, I did get the opportunity to, although we were told not to um, journey too far when we were there alone um, in the city, but um, uh, we kind of broke the rules and had a, a good look around and really enjoyed the art gallery and all of the art that, that's in the, in the um, open spaces and everything. Love the place. And um, yeah, I'm hoping one day once all this COVID is all over to, um, to go back again. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's going to happen. Absolutely. It will happen. So, so thank you so much. Thanks everyone. And so kia ora, Warren. And thanks, Javiera. Um, yes. Thanks uh, very much to Leonel and, and Warren for sharing uh, this wonderful um, experience. Um, definitely, um, I dream that we can do maybe some Maori version of a very Colombian song, for example, in the future. Why not? Uh, it would be a great, I think, uh, project uh, to do together. Um, I think, as, as you were saying, Leonel, there's so many common things um, our, our, I would say our indigenous uh, people share so much, um, much more knowledge and, and it's great uh, to be able to share with the ones that join us um, today. So um, Kapai, <laughs> uh, Warren and, and Leonel, it's been really, really a, um, a pleasure. And um, thanks everyone for joining us. Please, um, please when you can watch La Rosa de los Vientos, there's a link there. Uh, I literally cried uh, when I, I watched uh, and I was saying to Elena, uh, it was very emotional part for me because it's really beautiful to see how our cultures uh, merge uh, through music. So that's, that's, that's really uh, amazing and I, I see so many things. So we're in, uh, hopefully uh, you can cross the ditch at some point and, and be back in Medellin or some other beautiful cities in Colombia or even in Chile, more than welcome. Uh, and uh, Leonel, thanks again so much for suggesting uh, this, this cultural session for, for uh, everyone uh, this afternoon. It's really been a really nice close uh, of our participation, uh, participation at that check. Um, so, um, muchas gracias a, a todos nuevamente por, por estar con nosotros esta tarde. Eh, les agradezco mucho el tiempo, por favor no se olviden de guardar el link ahí de YouTube para que vean esta versión y ojalá que podamos tener una versión entre Colombia y Nueva Zelanda o Latinoamérica y Nueva Zelanda, creo que hay muchas más similitudes de lo que hay en diferencias. Así que Jorge, no sé si quieres hacer algún eh, comentario final, eh, gracias a todos los que nos pusieron ahí que les gustó la sesión, <ríe> ha sido muy, muy, muy entretenido, así que no sé, Jorge, si quieres hacer algún comentario y hacer algún cierre, eh, estamos ya, ok. <laughs> Por supuesto, muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Warren, Leonela, and Javiera. Uh, it is wonderful to get to know the Maori culture through its music and for sure your expertise. Uh, we invite you to be aware of the announcements and forums that have been published to encourage dialogue among, among all of us, as well as to visit the virtual stands of our exhibitors uh, where they can interact uh, with more than 15 institutions, including diamond, silver, and gold sponsors. And see you in a moment for the closing session. Muchas gracias, Warren, Leonel y Javiera. Realmente es maravilloso poder conocer la cultura maori a través de, de, de la música y de la experiencia y la experiencia de Warren, que es indudable. Nos invitamos a estar muy pendientes de los anuncios y de los foros que se han publicado para motivar el diálogo entre todos nosotros, así como una invitación cordial a visitar los stands de nuestros expositores donde podrán interactuar con más de 15 instituciones, incluidos los patrocinadores Diamante, Plata y Oro de este evento. Nos vemos entonces en un momento para la sesión de clausura. Muchas gracias a todos por su participación. Thanks for being here and see you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Y ahora. <coughs>